thank you for coming today. Um, let's see. Um, my name is Andy Robb. Um, I am the technical product manager for um, the Big Fast Data team at Walmart e-commerce. So we're the e-commerce side of Walmart. Um, a couple things. Um, our presentation is in two parts today. Um, I'm going to go through some introduction stuff and then hand it off to Ming Ming, who will talk about um, some more things in depth. Um, I will try to get through my portion of this relatively quickly um, so that Ming Ming will have as much time as possible uh, and to get to any questions. Um, I believe today's session is being recorded, so if you do have any questions later, please make your way to one of the microphones. All right. Uh, so, Ming Ming. Uh, Ray uh, and I are on the Big Fast Data team. Uh, we are actually one of two teams at Walmart that run large multi-tenant Hadoop infrastructure um, within Walmart uh, globally. Um, our team has been running shared infrastructure since about 2012. Um, our clusters are uh, in the dozens of petabytes and tens of thousands of cores range. Um, those are shared amongst all of our users and generally for research purposes. Um, as a result of that being uh, research targeted, somebody will come on, uh, run a research job, come up with something that they really like running, and then decide they want to run it all the time. Um, of course, what happens then is then it needs to run with a deadline, and it's a research cluster. Somebody else can come on and run any job that they want at any time, and it's very hard to uh, help someone uh, get their job to end at the right time. Um, so that is one of the uh, leading reasons that we started a project about a year ago um, to be able to deploy single tenant clusters uh, in our OpenStack environment. Um, these clusters might be yarn clusters, they may be Spark standalone clusters, um, or they might be uh, Facebook Presto clusters. Um, in addition to that, there were also a lot of teams that had uh, varying software uh, version dependencies. Somebody either wants to try out something new or stay on something older. Um, we also don't like using streaming uh, applications on our shared infrastructure. Um, those jobs essentially never end. Once you start one, um, you're always going to use those you know, 24 or 60 or 100 cores um, until the end of time, um, until your job changes and you're told to do something else. Um, as a result of that, in a shared environment, that's not really fair, right? Um, you are essentially taking cores away from um, other people's use cases. The idea with the shared infrastructure is you use it for a little while and then you give it back. Um, all right, also, um, we wanted to be able to uh, independently scale, and this is sort of a very traditional thing, um, scale CPUs and uh, data storage independently of one another for isolated use cases. Um, in some of our cases, we did, in fact, build dedicated Hadoop clusters for teams that had uh, very demanding or you know, very revenue-impacting jobs. Um, but if they were um, balanced too heavily in, uh, towards CPU or towards storage, you may end up with a bunch of idle cores or a bunch of idle disk. Um, and so we realized that we were able to cover a bunch of these use cases by uh, using our OpenStack infrastructure. Um, a different team uh, from us actually started building well, both the OpenStack infrastructure itself, that's not us, um, as well as the Ceph storage infrastructure that really enabled us to, um, to do this work. Um, they started that back in 2016. Okay. Uh, so for this talk, um, uh, we will be talking at a very low level, um, so I apologize if we go over um, a couple of people's heads at uh, one point or another. Um, we are hoping to be able to talk to essentially the contributors and operators of Ceph, uh, Swift, and OpenStack installations. Um, anybody who runs Hadoop uh, ecosystem technologies that talk uh, using the Swift API. Um, community members uh, from Hadoop ecosystem that deal with the file system interfaces, um, and then potential operators and highly technical users. Um, for the Hadoop ecosystem components, that's anything that can really talk to the HDFS interface. So that's uh, MapReduce, Tez, uh, Spark jobs, even Presto. Um, anything that you can implement something underneath those um, to talk to another system. 
So what specifically we're talking about? Uh, well, this is the layer that does that interface. So in uh, Hadoop file system land, there's an abstract interface that you can implement essentially an arbitrary storage mechanism underneath the HDFS um, API. And so that's, that's the software layer that we're talking about, that we're working with here. Um, the thing that actually enables a Hadoop component to talk directly to a, a Swift API. Uh, thank you to Comcast for providing the diagram for this back in their talk um, at OpenStack in Tokyo in 2015. Uh, so this is built on a lot of existing um, and very good work. Um, first and foremost from the OpenStack Sahara team that has a sub-project called Sahara Extras. Um, in that sub-project is essentially the canonical implementation of this driver um, that we just sort of refer to, refer to generally as Sahara Extras, but it's really a small piece of that overall project. Um, also, there is a, a Swift uh, driver built into Hadoop itself um, that we believe is actually a fork of Sahara Extra. Um, and then Comcast has also done some really great work with the Sahara Extra implementation, um, uh, patching that and helped guide us uh, in our early work with this. So thank you to them. Uh, the general architecture that we're using for all of this um, is that uh, persistent data is stored in object storage. The clusters that we have on our OpenStack compute infrastructure are totally ephemeral. Um, even when you've got large ephemeral disks attached to your uh, worker nodes, uh, the idea is that those clusters can be blown away at any time and don't, don't lose anything in the process of that. Uh, we accomplish that both through the use of object storage and a shared Hive meta store that all of the um, ephemeral clusters can talk to. So, um, you know, if somebody loads a table uh, in the data stored in the object storage, the metadata stored in the shared meta store, you spin up a new cluster, whether that's Yarn, Spark, or Presto, um, and you can immediately query data from that. There's no waiting, there's no loading data into that new ephemeral cluster, it's just there for you. Um, the other thing that was really nice about the way that the um, API was implemented, the way that the Sahara team did this, um, is that it allows you to plug it into an existing cluster. And so we're actually able to add this um, invisibly to our users onto our existing persistent infrastructure um, so that we can actually load data into object storage. We only do it in the same data center, um, but we are able to do like a dist CP um, from one of our persistent clusters out to object storage. So we can have jobs that may run primarily on a persistent cluster because we haven't migrated them over to using ephemeral clusters yet um, and copy data over that way. Um, that does not include the Metastore, so we would have to have some job that would, um, in the ephemeral land, go and add, say, partitions to a table over on the ephemeral side in the shared Metastore. Um, but the bulk of the work is able to be done by some large infrastructure. So in Ceph, you have the option to use uh, Swift or S3. Um, both APIs are supported um, from Ceph's object storage implementation. Um, on the S3 side, we, well, I guess I should start with, we actually spent several weeks when we started this project trying to figure out which one uh, we should use. Uh, we really were uh, interested in supporting both. So there are lots of projects that support S3 and we wanted to be able to take advantage of those. Um, uh, Swift was also interesting to us. There are some projects that uh, primarily use Swift. And so we were interested in the, the notion of using both. Why, why can't we do that? The software supports it, right? Um, if you are loading basic objects, you can use both. So at the binary level, you can load um, a file with Swift into a Ceph-backed storage system and pull it out with S3 and it, it's fine. The problem is with uh, pseudo directories, they're incompatible. So as soon as you start doing something with um, any complexity, especially with a Hadoop workload, um, you're not gonna be able to use the two of them together. Um, so that was a, a point we realized we had to pick one and stick with it. So on the S3 side, broad client side support, awesome. Um, unfortunately, when we did try to start using some S3 uh, APIs, we realized that a lot of clients are built only to talk to the canonical implementation of S3. I'm actually pointing them at a URL in your infrastructure sometimes is impossible without a patch. Um, they just don't support the notion of a URL that doesn't end in Amazon.com. Um, then there's the general concern around a closed standard. 
Um, the community doesn't own the S3 server-side implementation, and so if we need to make changes to it, um, we don't really have the option to do so. On the Swift side, client support's not universal. Um, unfortunately, well, that won't get better without adoption. Um, so if we go and start using this and request, request that tools that we want to use on top of our system use Swift, we can influence the community to um, more broadly support Swift. Um, and then in theory, tweaks and changes can be made more quickly with Swift because the community does own the, uh, the spec for that. In the end, we did decide to go um, with Swift. Hopefully that's relatively <laughs> obvious. Um, all right, so we are using a relatively older version of Sahara Extras. There are a couple of different branches of it. Um, we're using one called Icehouse um, with patches uh, that uh, we had uh, some help with. Some of the issues that we ran into um, immediately, we tried to run some Hive queries on ORC stored data they essentially fail uh, if you're doing anything with really any moderate sized data. There were an uncontrolled number of HTTP connections. We'd run a query and we might get 10,000 connections per, uh, per node. You're gonna overwhelm a couple of RGWs really quick with that. Uh, there were really slow meta operations. So deletes, renames, copies, especially with I object, object counts. Um, those just took absolutely forever. When we did run larger jobs with lots of objects being returned from a list operation, uh, they were being truncated. So we'd load some data to a table, and then we'd query it back, and we'd be missing half the table. Um, well, it turned out, as far as Hive was concerned, that data didn't exist because the, the files that were storing that data just weren't being returned, um, or weren't being uh, made available to the system. When we did run some tests with uh, long running processes, so in this case Presto, where the application actually stays resident, the, um, this would probably also be applicable to Impala. Um, we would run some queries one day, we'll go home, come back the next morning, run the same query again, up arrow, enter, and the query would fail. And we'd have to restart the cluster to fix that. Um, the API wasn't uh, re-authing against Keystone properly. Um, and then finally, we couldn't get large object support, which uh, was at least partially implemented um, in that branch. We couldn't get that working for us. Um, we couldn't get it to correctly break um, a file that was larger than five gigabytes. Okay, so why did we go off on our own a little bit? We spent several months patching the existing Sahara Extra code base um, such that we could actually return those patches to the community. We uh, realized within several months that that was taking a really long time. Um, and that there were some fairly dramatic changes that we needed to make that we couldn't do just with pull requests. Um, so we did essentially a, an experimental side project where we said, all right, let's just try making a bunch of changes and don't worry about making it you know, look nice for a pull request. Um, that ended up uh, being very successful for us uh, and we were able to add some performance features and make some modifications to fix a bunch of the issues we were running into very quickly. Uh, we also changed the name. So Swift A is intentionally slightly different. It's a bit of a nod to S3A um, so that we were more easily um, able to test. Um, so even the class name that we're using is Swift A instead of just Swift um, so that we can uh, load both jars into our application and just change configuration to um, switch between the implementations. Specific features that we implemented, bounded thread pools for things like listing, copying, deleting, rename. In some cases that adds um, parallelism, in some cases it limits the parallelism. Um, multiple write policies that adjust how the uh, how the driver uses local storage for the local worker that you're on, um, as well as the upload behavior. We designed the range seek support so that we could run query, Hive queries against ORC files, um, implemented uh, pagination uh, so that we could get more than 10,000 objects back from the server side, and LRU cache to limit header calls and stack calls um, against the API, um, which could, depending on if you're um, reusing a particular set of files can be themselves overwhelming and slow some things down. And then something we call lazy seek to adjust when we actually issue um, a rest call to the, um, to the server side that really uh, sped up 
our Presto queries. Um, along with all of this, we added a small patch to Ceph's implementation um, that adjusts a performance penalty that we ran into with uh, large objects that we'll talk about um, in a little bit right now. The large object support that we ran into was that, um, well, originally we couldn't get the client side support to work. Um, and so we built upon that um, to make that work correctly so we can split essentially at arbitrary size. Um, and then we also ran in, when once that was working, um, you would run Hadoop FS LS on a directory that has subdirectories, that has large objects in it, and has files in it. It doesn't really matter as long as it's got the large objects in it, this, this happens. So directories are returned correctly. They look like directories. The files come back correctly, they look like files. The large objects, unfortunately, look like directories. That's how they're implemented, that's how the system works, but there was no indication in a list, uh, the object you get back in the list call, that those subdirectories are actually large objects. And unfortunately, that's what you base a lot of work on. Um, and so there were cases where jobs would fail or um, user scripts wouldn't work properly. Um, that was itself problematic. The problem is to fix that, you have to issue a stat call for each of those subdirectories to make sure that they are or are not, in fact, um, directories. Doing that for a few is fine. Doing that for 10 or 20,000 subdirectories uh, is really a drag um, and could seriously degrade performance on something like a hive query where you're doing recursive, sorry, where you're doing recursive runs down um, a directory tree. Um, so we actually added a patch to Ceph uh, and some a little bit of code in uh, Swift A to adjust that behavior so that we could get back a little bit of information um, just to let us know that these subdirectories were these large objects um, and that dramatically improved the performance of queries and just general behavior of the system. Um, we are hoping that that essentially hack um, can be um, better implemented in the community as part of the Swift standard, um, which is something that S3 supports um, so that this particular use case can uh, more effectively run. All right, so um, caveats to what we've done. We've not tested against a Swift proper cluster. Um, we've only been running against a Ceph uh, cluster with the Swift API on it. The, um, because of that um, efficient, inefficient list mechanism, um, oh, we just talked about that. Sorry, I didn't go through these slides um, <laughs> too closely just before this. Um, okay, um, the patch that we applied to Ceph, um, you can see in a pull request, uh, 14592, um, and basically all we were populating is a header for the, si the total size of the object, and that's what gets returned to us in the list call, um, so that we know how big that uh, total object is. Um, so, performance results. Um, do you want to take over? Sure. Okay. So, uh, Meng Meng Liu is going to talk about the performance that we were able to determine from the system. Yeah, so uh, we did a couple of uh, performance evaluations to test uh, our performance against um, uh, Swift A versus um, Sahara Extra uh, um, against our SAP storage cluster. Um, so one thing we want to test out is how well our bounded threat pool perform. And, um, and we evaluate on a couple of file system operations such as deletion, renaming, and, um, and even uploading. And we also evaluated um, the difference of our di um, several um, write policies we implemented in Swift A. Um, and we look at both um, file system operations as well as um, a map reduce um, benchmarks such as um, high bench um, and pick one of the um, jobs um, called word count. And note that uh, here is the spec that we did our um, experiments. We ran in on a couple of um, OpenStack VMs, um, each with local SSD um, storage. And we tested against um, a SAF HDD, uh, a couple of um, storage, uh, HDD storage clusters. Um, and they are um, um, implementing um, a SAF version and with RGWs um, 
and um, HA proxy on top of that. Um, the first result, as you can see, um, this is uh, comparing Swift A and, um, and a Sahara Extra on a single operation Hadoop FSRM. This is deleting a large um, directory generated by high bench word count. This is the largest scale big data. It's uh, 1.6 terabyte of um, 6,600 objects. Um, um, multi split it into you know 256 megabyte chunks um, and we can see that since Sahara Extra inherently for this operation is a single threaded implementation um, but Swift A is able to add um, multiple um, threads um, to um, to essentially doing the deletion and uh, we can see um, some performance gains over here um, the next operation renaming essentially um, we are doing it on the same exact same settings as um, um, the deletion um, but rename is essentially a copy and delete um, we do this again um, um, comparing Swift A um, and Sahara Extra and we can see that since Swift A can enable multiple threads um, doing the renaming essentially uh, with only three threads we're able to see um, 3x performance gains. And with more, you can see that we bring down the uh, renaming um, performance from um, essentially uh, about an hour to a few seconds. Now, here are the three uh, right policies we implemented in Swift A. Um, the first one is called multi-part single thread. Um, and here we are um, dividing very large files into small split splits, and this is a, called a multi-part um, split. Um, and in this uh, single thread um, implementation, we only require a, a very minimum amount of storage on the local disk. We essentially um, only um, um, write to local storage one split at a time and uh, upload one um, at a time um, sequentially. Um, now, the second policy we also enable is called multi-part no split, where we essentially can um, save the whole file to local storage, assuming we have that enough um, local storage. And then we are able to upload them um, via um, like byte ranges uh, in multiple threads in parallel. And this is making uploading faster. Um, the third policy is really a combination where we um, enable buffering into local storage um, only um, several chunks, several splits, um, subject to the number of threads we enable, and then upload them asynchronously from the local writes um, to the object storage. Um, here is the result of uploading a single 100 gigabyte file. We split them into um, um, several chunks. And this is doing a single Hadoop FS put um, on a single SSD compute node. As we can see that um, single thread, one split is the slowest among the three, um, but it requires the least amount of local storage. No split requires the whole, uh, like um, 100 gigabyte on local storage to do this um, uploading. Um, and essentially a multi-part split here um, is the, has the best performance regardless of the, uh, the size of the split. Um, and it tells us that um, asynchronized uploading in multi-threads um, really has uh, a lot of performance gains. Um, we, we also compare the three policies in running a MapReduce job, uh, high bench work count. Um, this is uh, the 6.0 high bench work count job. Um, and we, we had three scales. Um, um, huge, gigantic, and big data. Note that the big data one generates 1.6 terabytes of data with uh, 30, uh, 60, 60 mappers and 60 reducers. Um, and we set four gigabyte per mapper reducer and ran it on 10 um, compute SSDs. Mm, the, the spec of each compute node is, um, um, has, has 52 gigabyte memory. Um, and we use the default settings um, within our Swift A thread parameters, we can see here that um, split, um, the, the split policy has the best performance um, among the three. Um, 
lazy seek is also an important feature enabled in Swift A. Um, it seeks only when necessary to read the data, and we see a huge number of um, uh, uh, it reduced a huge number of connection um, overheads to the input streams, which are common in Presto queries. And note that a, a feature similar um, to this has been implemented in S3A um, API as well um, in this um, Hadoop Jira ticket. Okay, so as future work, um, we plan to open source this um, after internal workload validation. It's most likely within the Wormer Labs uh, GitHub uh, repository. And, um, we are also looking to investigate um, using local tier storage for um, buffering before multi-part upload. That is leveraging um, memory as well as local disk. Um, we are also planning to look at um, multiple read policies to improve downloading speed. That is to, um, to fetching the objects from the object storage. Um, we are also very interested in supporting um, both Swift S3 API uh, protocols at the same time, meaning that um, we can have the Swift client uh, read data from S3 client generated um, object. And this requires a rewrite to um, essentially how the two protocols generate pseudo directories, um, because currently they put um, a zero byte file to different places to indicate whether there's a directory or a file. Um, all right, I'm going back to um, Andy to conclude the talk. Uh, me. Okay, cool. Um, so first of all, uh, so we were able to get Swift A to scale for us, and we were able to run some very uh, large workloads with it um, internally. Um, for our testing, and we're, um, we're using actually production workloads that we just happen to have snapshots of. Um, we would like to merge this work. Um, we don't really want to maintain a uh, file system driver for all of time, um, so we'd really like to get this work um, merged back into the community, um, and, as well as some of the changes that we've uh, discovered are necessary for really performant operation, um, get those made to the um, standards at some point. Um, we would love uh, folks' help to do that merging um, and to just make the code better in general. Um, and then, again, for the large object support, um, when it comes to pseudo directories, we would, um, there's still a little bit of work to be done in the community for that. Um, you may have noticed a couple of oddities in some of our testing data. Um, we noticed them, too. Um, we haven't uh, necessarily isolated the exact reasons um, why some of those numbers were off a little bit, or in some cases, a lot. Um, those are some of the work that we've got uh, left to do, is uh, figure out what those outliers were. So with that, uh, are there any questions? Hi. Um, hey. Did you exclusively test Swift A against uh, Swift provided by Ceph? Or do you have any knowledge of how it would perform against uh, Swift, Swift, <laughs> so to speak? We, we really only have uh, Ceph clusters uh, available to us, um, so we weren't able to test against Swift proper. OK, uh, follow up. Mm -hmm. um, does Swift on Ceph implement atomic rename? I've, I've used DiscCP yeah. and uh, noticed that, of course, DiscCP keeps temporary files and then moves them to a final uh, file committer staging location, which cause massive shuffles because it's, it's changing keys, essentially. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if uh, Ceph has a, a similar problem there. So Kyle Bader from Red Hat on the Ceph team just said that no, it's a, essentially an atomic operation. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Uh, so I work upstream with Sahara, and we're definitely uh, interested. Excellent. In, we're yes. definitely interested in your work. So wonderful. Let's talk about you know going upstream to like Sahara Extra or something like that. That would be awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate you coming to the talk. Thank you. Hey. Good talk and excellent performance improvements. A quick question, though. 
Yeah. Ta you talked about three issues, right? Uh, I can understand the performance improvements one thread to threaded pool. Um, you also talked about you know, a large number of HTTP connections with SwiftFS and mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, small uh, performance with large object count. Can you talk any improvements uh, in those uh, aspects? Yeah, so to talk specifically yeah, to so, those. Um, so we, we found that in Sahara Extra, a lot of times um, it, um, it, in some cases, it enables thread pooling, but, but, um, but it's uncontrolled, so you cannot actually bound it. So for instance, I'll give you an example that in Hive, you, you have this MACK repair table statement, where um, like for a very large table, you would essentially read all the directories and um, file, file system metadata and, and try to load them into the Hive metadata. Um, and in that call, um, we would essentially create an uncontrolled number of HTTP requests to the RGW side, and RGW would be essentially um, overwhelmed, and you cannot get any results back in that case. Uh, the other question was about the large directories. Um, the large directory performance issue um, was directly related to the ability to get back um, metadata information about whether the a subdirectory that you were listing um, is in fact a directory or a file, a large object. Um, and so that required a tweak to both um, Ceph's Swift server-side implementation um, as well as uh, Swift A. Yes, uh, good talk. Thank you. So, uh, so in real case, for example, in for your workloads, uh, large objects is more important or massive small objects is more important? Or both? Or? It depends. Okay. Um, so in our case, we've noticed that if we break even moderate size objects into smaller objects, mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit easier to parallelize the reads for them. Um, in cases with large data sets, um, to keep lar those large data sets in single containers just for sort of logical organization purposes, um, it's necessary to um, try to tailor the object size to get as close as possible to the limit without going over it um, so that you can keep the total number of objects in that container um, minimized. So it just totally depends on the, the workload that you're targeting or the particular data set that you're talking about. Uh, at least in our case. Yeah, the second question is, uh, when you bring a lot of threads in the client, I guess in the client, right, Swift APIs, it will so, so, so it's uh, when you issue a call, like for instance for a MapReduce job, uh -huh. these threads are not only on the clients, but also on all the mapper, like all the worker nodes of the. Yeah, so the question is, is there any overhead like uh, brought by this design? Because you have, you, now you bring a lot of mm. extra stress. It may take some CPU cycles. Since, from I think, in my understanding, since object storage o would only allow you know HTTP requests to fetch any object, right? And, and hence, you know, those threads are inevitable. Um, and the only way that we can make it better is to have a better control of it. Um, so we know how many threads are initiated from the client and on each of the worker nodes of Hadoop. Um, to the, the uh, to the server essentially. So you don't see any real both real problems when you run your applications. With we, the we've seen a lot of problems. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. One of the one of the pieces of work that we've spent time doing is figuring out what the right number of threads to use is. Um, I think even with some of the testing, you can see highly diminished returns when you start really cranking up the number of threads. Um, there are a number of reasons for that, but Yes, at some point you just get to a, um, a state where it doesn't matter how many more you add, you're not going to, you may actually degrade your performance. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You talked about using dynamic large objects mm -hmm. for the large object support. Did you investigate using static large objects? And what was that like? Why did you choose DLOs instead of SLOs? I think we went with DLOs mostly because they're, um, well, they work a little bit better with our use cases, which are always within a single, um, uh, a single container. Um, and so they're, this is a little bit more straightforward. There's nothing that crosses the container, it, um, and the reading the manifest wasn't, isn't really necessary for a dynamic large object, so you don't need to figure out where you're supposed to go to grab things. Um, and so it was just a little bit more straightforward. I had a question about, uh, you mentioned the impedance mismatch in uh, S3 and Swift doing the uh, kind of fake directory mm -hmm. um, 
was saying. Can you expand on that? It, it, like in a lot of libraries, like for example, JClouds, you'd often use a uh, similar approach of uh, creating an object with a trailing slash uh, mm -hmm. of zero size, which works on both providers. Uh, so what specifically did you run into that? I'm so just curious. What we found is that um, there's a zero byte file created on the SWIP side um, um, along with the directory. So at the level of the directory, right, you create a zero byte file to indicate this is a directory, not a file. This is the Swift standard. Um, on the S3 side, there's also similar, but that zero byte file is placed at a uh, subdirectory level. So that would make um, the, I think that would, without code changes, these two clients are incompatible. So a lot of cases we create data using one client, right? Uh, we create data using Swift client, then those directories are arranged that way. Uh, but then the S3 client cannot read data um, directly. Um, it, it, sorry, you, you may need to explain a little bit clearer. Uh, I guess I was getting at the point where, um, let's say I'm trying to create a directory foo in the subdirectory bar. Mm -hmm. I'd create, uh, in, in both places I'd imagine creating a foo slash and a foo bar slash. Uh, and these are just objects, right? So because the flat yeah. mm -hmm. namespace. So there's no actual notion of directory necessarily. No. Uh, so um, could, could you explain one more time? I, I must be missing something here. It gets, I mean, it's essentially hacked in, right? Um, if you're using just the Swift CLI, uh, that's all you have to do. Um, for whatever reason, and I'm not totally clear on the details, um, with, in order for Hive to see those as directories, you actually need to add a zero byte file that doesn't include the slash. And so you end up with two files, one or two objects, one that is uh, bar slash foo, no trailing slash, and then another one that is bar slash foo slash. Um, without that, Hive doesn't see the subdirectory as a subdirectory, and you end up with a bunch of um, yeah. very strange data. Um, on the S3 side, there's um, a similar syntax, but it's just slightly different. Um, I think there may have actually, there's actually like a string that you're supposed to append, like the literal word directory or something that normally gets hidden by the API. Um, and this is all from by memory from a year ago from Google searches when we were trying to do this. Um, and so it's not that they're to they're only incompatible in very superficial ways. Um, it's just that they're bad enough that it's frustrating to work with. And I have to say, these are implementations of the Swift and S3A driver code. Uh, it's not something that created by you know the Swift or Seth backend. Okay, looks like it. Um, if you guys have any more questions, we'll be around afterwards. Um, again, we are really looking forward to working with the community on this, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Thanks.